Hello folks, I thought I'd take a little look at the Sinclair ZX80 today. I've dusted it off for one of its very rare outings and I thought it might be of interest to other people to have a look at it as well. So I thought, yeah, why not? So this is a computer I bought back in 2009 and I know it was 2009 because the day it actually turned up to the house I had a rather nasty car accident. Actually I had a, a lorry slam into the side of my car, it nearly took me out completely but anyway completely beside the issue yes this is a computer launched by Sinclair in January of 1980 for the retail price of just under £100 pre-built or just under £80 if you wanted it in kit form because yes you can get this in kit form as well so at the full retail price, adjusting for inflation of £100, that would be approximately £430 today. So, um, so yeah, it was, it was quite a, an expensive proposition. But, I mean, computing was brand new back then and, and these things weren't cheap. Th this was by far, I think, the cheapest computer on the market, apart from maybe those little hobbyist kits. So you had the, the Sinclair MK14, may have been a bit cheaper. Acorn System 1, I think, was possibly floating around about this time as well. That might have been cheaper. But but yeah, anyway, this was probably the first sub £100 proper computer. And when I say proper computer, I mean, a, you know, a proper, um, proper design case and keyboard. When I say proper keyboard, it's kind of a, a membrane-y thing. But anyway, yes. In that respect, it was absolutely groundbreaking. And yes, I know, before anyone says it, there was another computer that came out in 1980 that absolutely knocked spots off it. And yeah, that was the, the Commodore VIC-20. But all I'm going to say is about this, and this is a wonderful, wonderful computer, don't get me wrong. This was three times more expensive. So they're not really comparable. So whereas, you know, this is something you could game on, the ZX80 very much not. So let's have a little tour, shall we? So it comes with this vacuum moulded case, which is incredibly fragile. This particular one, it's showing its age, but I think it's allowed to after 40 years. It's got a few scrapes and scratches. It's pretty yellow. I think the camera makes it look a lot better than it actually is. Comes with this membrane keyboard which has absolutely no tactile feel whatsoever, but I think looks really, really nice. Um, the corner has been broken off at some point by someone and glued back on. That happened before my ownership. But it's such a nice looking thing as well. This at the back, it looks like a vent and really should have been a vent, but isn't. It's actually painted on to look that way. And I know a lot of these computers failed they had a terrible reliability record because they overheated all the time. So when I run mine, I tend to run it with the case off just to just to mitigate that problem. Looking at the back, it's very simple. You've got three 3.5mm jacks. So you've got your mic and ear sockets for your loading and saving of software. You've got your DC in, your RF out, and then you've got the edge connector, which I think was used for RAM expansions. It may have had other functions as well, I'm not sure. Underneath, very simple affair. There are no serial numbers on it anywhere. It's just got the um, labeling for the sockets and a little label there just to say Sinclair ZX80. That's painted on, by the way, that's not a sticky label. It's incredibly tatty, but I do have the original box for it as well. Um, it's clearly seen better days. It does have a stamp on it that says serial number 96, but I really don't think that relates to the computer. That's probably some sort of postage, um, because I think that would be ridiculous. Inside, yeah, the polys are okay. They're not pristine, but they're, they're complete. They're not, they're not massively damaged. Back in the day, you would have got a program test card, so you could run a very basic program on the computer, which I don't have. The user manual, which I do have. Um, do, do, do. Power brick, which is just a very simple, unregulated nine volt affair. 
You would have got the cassette leads as well, which again, I don't have, but they are, from what I can tell, identical to the, um, to the ZX81. And the RF lead, and this is the original RF lead as well. Now, when I first got the computer, uh, obviously the seller said, oh, it's, it's untested, which usually means to me it doesn't work. I plugged it in, powered it up, and it didn't work until I had a look at this connector and I unscrewed it and I found the, uh, the cable had become detached inside. I reconnected it and it seemed to work. So um, that was the only issue I've had with the machine. So whether it was genuinely untested or he tested it using this cable and couldn't get a picture, I don't know, but there it is. It was, it was a win for me. Now, I believe the really early models actually came with a white power supply. So this must be a slightly later one with the black. It's got a bit of a rattle to it, but it does seem to work okay. Um, I should probably crack it open at some point and make sure everything's okay with it. Or maybe not use it at all. Maybe a 40-year-old power supply isn't the, isn't the safest thing to use. But it's unregulated, so I can't imagine there's much to fail in it that would cause problems for the computer. So I've been using it. The manual is pretty comprehensive and well laid out. And it's designed around people who've never used a computer before in their lives, which back in 1980 would be fairly common, I would think. Um, on the back, it's actually, it's not Sinclair Research, so it predates Sinclair Research. Science of Cambridge, at Six Kings Parade, before they moved. So that's how old this is. Uh, copyright 1980. So it goes through... The introduction, getting started, tells you how to plug it in and set it all up. So pretty standard stuff for 80s micros. And then it starts explaining a little bit about how the computer works. So it goes into things like binary codes. And now we're starting to look at some basic commands. Keyboard layout. Simple strings, that sort of thing, you know. It's um, yeah, it's quite a it's quite a comprehensive manual actually. One thing the ZX80 doesn't do is it doesn't handle floating point arithmetic, so it's integers or nothing, I'm afraid. So that's that's very limiting. But um, but then you've got to think about the cost of the machine and what it was actually designed to do. You know, it was designed for the hobbyist or someone who wanted to learn basic programming and this computer fits that bill perfectly. So let's have a little look inside, shall we? So inside, what we've got is a load of off-the-shelf logic chips, an awful lot of them. And when you consider this is functionally almost identical to the ZX81 and that has four chips in it, you can see why later computers have ULAs in them. Condense all of this down, make the computer cheaper to build. But yeah, this is pre-ULA, so the only real you couldn't even call it a custom chip, I suppose, but there's the the ROM, really, which has got the um, the operating system baked into it. And we've got the Z80 there, which is an NEC construction. And here we have the reason why a lot of ZX80s fail, is a very small heatsink coupled to the 7805 voltage regulator that gets incredibly hot and just cooks the inside of this case. I've got to say though, it's a neat little design. I have no way of knowing whether this is a factory build or whether it was a home build because it could have been a very neat home build. I honestly don't know.
it is marked as an issue two. I don't know what the significance of that is. I can't find any information on, on the issue numbers, how many issue ones were released, if indeed any. I don't know. Everyone I've seen online seems to be an issue two. I've never seen an issue one. Um, presumably they're about. I honestly don't know. And looking at the top case itself, you can see just how incredibly flimsy this thing is. It, it would be very easy to break it. It wouldn't take much force at all. So you've got to be so incredibly careful. It's so thin, the plastic. It's really, really fragile. So it's not had a run for a couple of years, at least, this machine. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to power it up and um, see if we still get a picture. And we'll, we'll have a look at the actual operation. You know, my favourite thing about this machine is how British the keyboard is. It doesn't have a delete button. It has a rub out. How cool is that? Right, we're hooked up and we're hooked up to a CRT because really this is the only practical way you're going to get a picture on it without modifying it, which is not something I want to do. So let me just pop them in the stand. So what you'll see is we've got a um, very similar to a, a ZX81. We've got our K cursor there that we get on startup. It's completely monochrome, there's no colour, there's no sound. But then what do you want for a for a hundred pounds computer back in 1980? It's got the same well I should say similar keyword entry to the ZX81 and Spectrum in that um single press of a key will write out the entire word and that's done purely to save space in the ROM rather than having individual typed letters. You'll notice actually as I press the key there's a flicker and that's because of a limitation with the hardware in that it can't produce a video signal and process information at the same time so it's one or the other. But in reality the flick is not that bad. What you will notice is if you run a longer program then yeah, it's going to, um, you're going to have a black screen until that program finishes running. So whereas they got around it with the ZX81 by introducing a slow mode. So it halved the performance of the computer, but it did mean it could, it could keep generating a picture at the same time. ZX80 doesn't have that. 10. A equals 1. Uh, oh, what have we got? 40. Just something simple. All it's going to do is count, run, enter. Screen goes off, it makes the calculation, screen comes back on, and there we go. So yeah, a games machine, it's not. Having said that, I've seen a lot of really exciting demos that people have put on YouTube using a ZX80 and maybe just a little bit of extra RAM and they've, they've really been able to squeeze some in really impressive things out of this machine. So um, Space Invaders, for example, I've seen that and it's been flicker free. I think that's an amazing achievement. So the machine's been on for ooh, 10 minutes now, thereabouts, and CPU's pretty hot. The heatsink is ferociously hot. I couldn't keep my finger on there without burning it. Um, and that's with the case open. And this is how I tend to run it. You can imagine the temperatures this thing was getting up to when that that top case is put on. And it's, it's no wonder these things failed. It really isn't. This is why they are so unreliable. They're just cooking. If you're going to use these, you're going to need to modify them. You're going to need to refit either a bigger heatsink or some sort of switching regulator in there. That wouldn't be a big job. You're also going to need to modify the video output. Again, that can be done fairly easy, I think. For the case of mine, I don't want to modify it. I want to keep this computer as it is, as it left the factory or potentially the, the, the hobbyist's bench. I really don't know.
Um, that's a personal choice. And for that reason, I don't use it very often. It comes out and gets dusted off once every couple of years. But, you know, whenever I do that, it, it makes me smile. And then it gets put away again. Just to preserve it. So, yeah. That's my ZX80. And that's a, a really cool, yet really limited machine. I hope you enjoyed having a look at it with me. As always, please take care and I'll catch you on the next one. Bye.